So ladies and gentlemen, on uh, behalf of the U.S. Helsinki Commission, I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon on a very important briefing. Today, we look at uh, what is now the seven, uh, second glucose uh, trial of uh, the Kale uh, quarter cuffs. Uh, my hope is uh, that by shedding light on this case, uh, we will not only see the gross injustice uh, committed against uh, Mr. Kodakovsky, uh, but also against the entire Russian judicial system. The trial against him and Yukos began in 2003 as what many saw to be a politically motivated attack by the Kremlin. After almost a decade, the case against Mr. Kodakovsky has evolved into a complete show trial where the accusations against the defendant have become absurd. And though in 03, many would have entertained the arguments of the prosecution, uh, today we find ourselves unable to do so. Despite recent historic uh, rhetoric, uh, excuse me, strike the word historic, uh, Despite recent rhetoric on uh, human uh, rights reform uh, from uh, uh, the Russian president, very little has yet been accomplished. And so it is with concern we look towards Russia's future, concern for a fair hearing uh, for Mr. Uh, Kordakovsky, and concern for society based on the rule of law. It is my belief uh, that the case against him is not only the trial of one man, but a trial of the integrity of Russia's courts and judges. With that, um, my thanks to Freedom House, uh, who are assisting and sponsoring uh, this matter with the Helsinki Commission. But I'd like to welcome our esteemed uh, our guests, uh, Vadim uh, Kalul Bagan, and I, uh, stand to be corrected about the name, and uh, Anton Drell. Um, Vadim has served as the lead trial lawyer on the defense team for Mr. Kordakovsky. Uh, before practicing law, he served as a member of Russia's upper house of parliament. Mr. Drell has also served um, as uh, Mr. Kordakovsky is a lawyer and is a graduate of Moscow State University Law Department. More information on our guests can be found uh, in the biographies which uh, have been made available uh, outside. In addition, um, uh, the information uh, shared here uh, uh, will be placed uh, on our website and um, I wish to extend uh, an early apology. At some point, a vote is going to be called, and I'm going to be required uh, to leave. But my colleagues uh, uh, in the briefing, and Kyle Parker and the rest will go forward. Uh, thank you, and with that, uh, buddy, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I hope for your understanding because I'm going to speak Russian. I'm uh, going to do that because I can't rely in full my English uh, in such a responsible mission which I have seen here. Thank you. Прежде всего, уважаемый господин председатель, и поскольку я знаю, что вы судья, ваша честь. Above all, I esteem Mr. Chairman because uh, I know that you're a judge, your honor. Uh, уважаемые дамы и господа, позвольте мне от имени команды защиты Михаила Ходорковского и от его имени, поскольку он, конечно же, знает о том, что я здесь, выразить нашу искреннюю благодарность и признательность за приглашение уважаемую высокую комиссию и за возможность поделиться с вами своими мыслями. Please allow me on behalf of uh, Михаил Ходорковского's uh, uh, team of lawyers and uh, on his own 
be happy to see, of course, notes uh, that we're here and uh, what we're here to do. Uh, to thank you for the kind of invitation extended to us uh, to uh, brief the high commission and uh, those interested on uh, what is going on uh, at the trial. And uh, we, of course, see this as a, a, a very high point. Хотел бы также с самого начала поблагодарить э, уважаемую правозащитную организацию Freedom House за поддержку организации этой встречи, а также за всю поддержку, которую мы получаем э, от вас э, в деле защиты наших, э, наших подзащитников for uh, assistance in uh, organizing this briefing and uh, much more broadly uh, for the assistance that uh, they have generously provided to us as we have uh, sought to defend the interests, the interests uh, of our defendants. <laughs> And uh, later in my remarks, I intend to uh, once again mention uh, why we need this assistance, uh, why such assistance is important to us as long as it comes from uh, human rights organizations, whether multilateral, uh, US based, uh, European, or Russian uh, human rights organizations. And uh, not only human rights organizations. Уважаемые дамы и господа, я был очень впечатлен тем, как сформулировано название нашей сегодняшней встречи. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been greatly impressed by the title that's been assigned to this meeting today. Я даю должное оптимизму авторов этого названия, которые верят, что этот процесс когда-нибудь закончится. I would like to give credit to the optimism of the authors. Uh, who seem to believe that this trial will actually come to an end at some point. Возможно, у нас в России, у нас участников, ежедневных участников этого события уже, как мы говорим, замылился глаз, но мы пока не видим никаких признаков завершения. Hence, uh, our vision, uh, when I say our, I'm referring to those uh, participating in the trial on a pretty much daily basis in Russia, is not as clear. Uh, and uh, we, uh, quite frankly, do not quite see this trial come to any kind of end whatsoever. I would like to emphasize that in our understanding, the second process is a very complex thing, a very complex concept, especially in our mind. I'd like to note that uh, what can be referred to as the second trial, or uh, it's really just a uh, matter of convention. Uh, it's a formality. Потому что по существу своему дело Ходорковского и дело Юкса в целом это одна большая расправа, которая началась, как совершенно справедливо отметил господин председатель, в 2003 году, то есть уже более 7 лет назад, и продолжается, и конца ей не видно, пока она только ширится. MBK case uh, and the Yukos case uh, brought more broadly, um, which can be described as a legal massacre, is something that started as a uh, distinguished from chairman uh, said over seven years ago in uh, 2003, has been going on, uh, whether it's trial number one or trial number two, does not really matter that much because uh, this case has uh, only been gathering momentum and at this point, it is not really clear if it will ever come to an end. Uh, so far, it's only been gathering momentum and getting and getting bigger and worse. The множество число заложников и жертв этой расправы, ну жертв пока к счастью фигурально смысле слова, надеюсь, что так и останется. Но тем не менее это сломанные судьбы человеческие. The number of those uh, who become hostages to this legal massacre and uh, those who have been sacrificed by sacrifice, uh, fortunately, at least for the time being, I'm not referring to any kind of uh, uh, physical uh, uh, situations, 
but uh, be it as it may, uh, many, many lives and uh, increasingly large number of lives uh, have been broken in the windmill of this little massacre. И вот этот э, второй процесс, который сейчас э, все-таки медленно, но близится к завершению, как судебная процедура, последствия его мы еще не знали, и будет ли он последним, или будет еще третий, или какой-нибудь еще, мы этого не знаем тоже. Но он, безусловно, является продолжением и составной частью вот этой большой расправы, о которой мы говорим. So what is uh, formally uh, referred to as a uh, second trial, uh, is slowly uh, moving, dragging to its end uh, as a legal proceeding, as a courtroom procedure. Uh, whether or not there will be a third trial or even another one, we do not yet know. Uh, but uh, we see uh, this uh, so called uh, second trial as a part and parcel of what was unleashed over seven years ago and uh, what constitutes a legal massacre. So, для наших защитных результатов этого второго процесса, то в самом пессимистическом варианте, который формально можно рассматривать с точки зрения российского закона, это дополнительные до 15 лет тюремного заключения. Но мы не знаем результаты и возможные результаты этого второго процесса. Говоря о специальных результатах этого процесса в легальных терминах, uh, as far as our defendants are concerned, uh, the worst case uh, scenario under the Russian law uh, is, just a, is that uh, uh, a new sentence that may be handed down uh, can uh, leave them in uh, behind bars uh, for another 15 years. И, конечно, так как изначально вся эта расправа имела под собой политический и коррупционные и коррупционные мотивы так это и обстоит сегодня. And just as uh, was the case seven years ago, when this massacre began and it was driven by political and uh, corruption considerations, the case uh, remains the same. Uh, what is happening uh, in that courtroom now is, as before, driven by political considerations and uh, those of corruption. Пожалуй, что можно сегодня добавить еще один мотив, потому что э, уже те, кто организовали и исполняют эту расправу, наверняка задумываются о последствиях для себя в том случае, когда всему этому будет для нас проявляться. Uh, is yet another factor, uh, and there is yet a third motivation for uh, what is going on, and that concerns uh, individuals who uh, put all this together and uh, started all of this uh, many years ago, I'm quite sure that right now they're sitting down and thinking as to what the implications might be for them personally of uh, this uh, case finally coming to its end. Такая оценка уже дана многими иностранными судами, международными судами, включая Европейский суд по правам человека и политическими межгосударственными организациями. Но мы верим в то, что Придет время, когда такая оценка будет дана и в нашей стране, в России. They uh, need to be trying and hedging their bets and uh, figuring out what the implications uh, will be. However, uh, it is um, already reasonably clear uh, what uh, the world thinks uh, of what is happening as uh, has transpired in uh, decisions and uh, made by statements made by various political bodies, intergovernmental bodies, uh, international courts, including the um, European Court of Human Rights. And uh, uh, hopefully uh, the uh, Russian public and uh, the Russian Federation uh, will offer a similar assessment uh, to those already voiced by these organizations. И мы, как сторона защиты, как команда в целом, я включаю понятие и Михаила Ходорковского, и Платон Лебедева, и Насова Защитника, ведя свою борьбу сегодня в московском суде, не только боремся за конкретные человеческие судьбы, которые уже сломаны и которые хотят ломать дальше. And uh, as defense, and uh, by defense I uh, mean not only the attorneys, but also the defendants themselves, uh, as we try to fight 
in the uh, courtroom in uh, Moscow for uh, lives that have uh, largely been already ruined, but uh, lives that uh, others are, are trying to continue to ruin as we are trying to mount and uh, sustain a defense against those efforts. Но у нас есть еще одна очень важная цель, она не противоречит первой. Она просто далеко выходит за пределы конкретных судей. Мы ведем борьбу против преступных действий наших государственных должностных лиц, которые путем классификации, угроз, шантажа, различных преступных методов занимаются вот as we're doing that, we're setting yet another goal, uh, which uh, in a way transcends and uh, reaches uh, beyond the efforts to uh, salvage the uh, human lives involved. And uh, uh, that goal is our efforts to expose and uh, to uh, not leave uh, unpunished uh, the corrupt and criminal behavior of uh, those uh, government, uh, government officials and uh, public servants who, through uh, using a vast array of uh, uh, techniques and methods which have involved uh, threats, uh, all kinds of criminal action, uh, falsification, uh, forgery, uh, and uh, torture, have uh, used all of that uh, to try and uh, uh, execute the plan uh, to legally massacre uh, MBK and the Pakistan government. We have repeatedly stated against the we, and when I say we, again, I include um, Mikhail Barakovsky and Tom Lender, and of course their defense team, have repeatedly said that uh, we uh, view this kind of behavior as a criminal, and uh, we also believe that what we're doing in court is we're not defending uh, the uh, innocence, uh, we're not holding the innocence uh, of the defendants, but rather we are trying to prove the criminal nature of the actions taken against them. Мы абсолютно убеждены в том, что это дело не является внутренним делом Российской Федерации только. We are 100% convinced that uh, this case and this situation is not just a domestic affair of the Russian Federation. Потому, во-первых, что речь идет о базовых человеческих ценностях, на которых стоит современная западная цель. The reason being that what's at stake, what's at stake here is uh, universal, fundamental uh, human rights values, values that underlie the very foundation of the Western civilization. Uh, among those uh, values, I would primarily call your attention to the freedom of the individual and uh, the law as the body of laws and as a, as a uh, major component of human civilization. И я бы сказал мое личное мнение, что в данном случае речь идет не столько о хулиганстве, потому что мы под хулиганством в крайней мере, мы в России обычно понимаем такие спорадические действия, такие крайне тяжелые формы азарства в целях самоутверждения. А речь идет в данном случае о системном крушении вот этих общецивилизационных ценностей в России. And I would like, and that is my personal opinion, to emphasize that what we have in mind is not uh, what can be referred to as legal hooliganism or thuggery, because uh, very least in Russian and in Russia, the word, uh, the word hooliganism refers as uh, uh, to um, sort of radical instances of extreme mischievery, if you will. Uh, but those that occur sporadically, those that are not sustained and systemic. Uh, what we have here is, as a matter of fact, a systemic 
effort to trample underfoot the uh, very fundamental values of civilization. И к большому сожалению, вот в этом деле, как в капле воды, видны все признаки вот этого крушения права, о котором уже всерьез говорят лучшие и самые честные юристы нашей страны. And unfortunately, this case mirrors as a drop of water would uh, the uh, very collapse of war which um, is occurring in the Russian Federation and uh, which has been uh, mentioned uh, by uh, the better, the uh, more courageous and the more honest uh, lawyers and legal efforts of that country. Особо трагично и драматично то, что такие оценки делаются честные, тяжелые, но честные, делаются на фоне продекларированного стремления к верховенству. What is especially uh, tragic and uh, dramatic is that such assessments, as grave but honest as they are, have been made against uh, a background of uh, rhetoric and uh, lip service. То, что было поддержано всеми всеми цивилизованными странами, как стремление Российской Федерации, и была выражена солидарность в этом стремлении с нашими властями. And of course, when the authorities started talking about the rule of law and seeing it as as the supreme value, this was hailed by the rest of the world, and they were praised for uh, trying to establish the uh, rule of war in Russia. And that is especially ironic uh, that uh, what is happening is happening against that very background. That is exactly why we believe that the uh, case at hand is not a domestic uh, affair for Russia. But rather, it is an issue, a problem that uh, should be put on the agenda of uh, international contacts and international relationships. Uh, uh, one party to which is the Russian Federation, the other, the other being other countries, uh, at every and all levels of such uh, international contacts. We are about this process. Московском экономическом суде это с позволения сказать придворный процесс, потому что при внешней видимости соблюдения процедур он просто является прикрытием расправ. We um, have referred uh, to the trial in the Komolniki uh, district court of uh, the city of Moscow as a sham trial, a pretend trial, if you will. Because while appearances are uh, being kept and uh, things are allegedly occurring in the context of a trial, this in fact uh, is just a smokescreen, uh, a cover-up for uh, people's lives being destroyed. Само обвинение фальшивое притворное, потому что это обвинение в том, что невозможно совершить. И только не было совершено, не не могло быть совершено. To begin with, uh, the charges are fake and pretend charges because essentially they accuse the defendants uh, not only of uh, something that they never did, but as a matter of fact, they're self-defeating because what they accuse the defendants of is something that was simply impossible to do. It could never have been done. Yeah, последствии, если будет интересно, готов пояснить это подробнее, в ответ на вопрос. I'll be happy to uh, give a certain level of detail and uh, explain should it be questioned. Но такое притворное фальшивое обвинение подтверждается такими же притворными фальшивыми доказательствами, которые являются результатом подделок документов, фальсификации, сокрытий, искажений фактов. I will say uh, that the sham nature of the charges is actually quite consistent with the quality of the so-called evidence, evidence uh, produced by the uh, prosecution which has been produced uh, using forgery, falsification, uh, distortion of facts, and uh, uh, forgery documents. Methods, which are called the 
это угрозы, шантаж, пытки, давление на адвокатов, давление на специалистов, на бухгалтеров, на аудиторов, или получение фальшивых бюджетных One in which there is not a single instance of uh, 
not only criminal behavior, but even uh, unlawful behavior. Even uh, misdemeanor type of behavior Эти, on the part of our defense. Эти так называемые факты придуманы, фальсифицированы, как я уже сказал. Uh, these so-called facts uh, have been uh, concocted uh, and uh, falsified. Таким образом, последствия вот этого дела Тарковского, дела Юкоса, они uh, далеко идущие. Они uh, существуют как для непосредственно жертв и заложников самого этого дела, в первую очередь, Михаила Тарковского. Therefore, the consequences and implications of the Korokovsky case and the uh, Yukos case are uh, very far-reaching. Uh, of course, they incorporate uh, what uh, will happen to the uh, victims and the hostages of uh, that trial, uh, primarily uh, Mikhail Korokovsky himself. But they also the consequences and implications of this case are also of uh, very direct relevance uh, to what the prospects of uh, my country, the Russian Federation, are going to be. Назовем ли мы эти перспективы словом модным словом модернизация или просто будущее? Это не важно. And whether we'll use the uh, buzzword modernization to refer to those prospects, or if we just uh, say the future of Russia, uh, the choice of word is not important in this case. Как я уже пытался коротко отметить, это, это дело э, имеет э, самые прямые непосредственные, непосредственные влияния, последствия для делового сообщества, для инвесторов, для э, других международных партнеров в мире, включая, конечно же, Соединенные Штаты. As I had, as I had tried to uh, mention briefly, this case has ramifications for the business community, for investors, for Russia's international partners, uh, and of course uh, for the United States as one of Russia's international partners. Again, the Korakovsky and Yugos case presents an impediment and uh, an obstacle for uh, what uh, is long overdue in uh, our relationship and the Russia-US relationship, uh, which, of course, uh, uh, the things being you have been referred to as uh, resetting the relationship, but whether or not you use that political term or just talk about improving and enhancing the relationship, this uh, case uh, creates a major impediment for everything that needs to be done. And uh, simply, uh, I cannot uh, visualize a successful effort to improve this relationship uh, with this case remaining what it is and where it is. <laughs> Да, на самом деле, вещь, что на самом деле делается в России, исход этого дела, справедливый или несправедливый, будет важнейшим и точнейшим индикатором. And uh, yet another role that this case plays uh, is that of an indicator uh, as to what is uh, happening in Russia, uh, in which direction it is moving, and uh, whether this case will end justly or uh, unjustly will uh, be a very clear signal of uh, where Russia is headed. Именно поэтому мы говорим, что очень важен и очень нужен голос мировой общественности. That is exactly why we have said that uh, it is of great importance that the international public voice its opinion. Голос который uh, скажет, что эта проблема должна быть в повестке дня всех уровней. Uh, in the sense that uh, this issue must be put on the agenda of uh, international context when Russia and the rest of the world at uh, any and all levels. Uh, в повестке дня как публичных, так и не публичных дипломатических. It should be on the agenda of both uh, public and uh, uh, private diplomatic interactions. Поддержка общественных правозащитных организаций по всему миру. 
and в Америке and support and support from human rights NGOs uh, all over the world in Europe uh, in uh, uh, in the Americas everywhere is uh, very badly needed. Это то, что критически важно для справедливого решения той проблемы, о которой мы сегодня These things are critically important if the problem that we are discussing here today uh, is to see some kind of a fair ending. And we believe that the United States as a major partner of the Russian Federation is in a position to make a significant contribution to как по линии парламентских э, возможных действий, так и по линии действий исполнительной власти, правительства Соединенных Штатов. Both through parliamentary action, possible parliamentary action, and uh, through the channels used by the executive branch of the United так, States. Так и со стороны общественности, гражданского, гражданского общества, которое славится своей активностью и своей неизбежной, неизменной приверженностью базовым And on the part of the civil society in the United States, which is very well known for being uh, vigil, active, and uh, invariably committed to the uh, fundamental uh, universal human rights values. Подписание Хельсинского акта в 1975 году застало меня достаточно молодым человеком, но уже внимательно следящим за такими событиями. As the Helsinki Act was signed back in 1975, uh, yours truly was still a uh, fairly young individual, and yet I was uh, very aware and uh, very watchful of uh, this kind of development. As a matter of fact, in 1975, I enrolled at, uh, at the law school, and uh, all those things I found extremely interesting and important. И поэтому я прекрасно помню, как велико было значение, в том числе и в моей стране тогда, в Советском Союзе, этой третьей корзины, в которой активнейшим образом ставились и обсуждались вопросы прав человека. And I remember the great importance, including in my then country, the USSR, attached to the so-called third basket, uh, which of course incorporated uh, human rights issues that uh, was very heavily discussed as part of the framework of the Helsinki Act. I прекрасно помню, как в той супер империи свет держали, империи зла, как ее еще называли, происходили подвижки под влиянием этого хельсинского процесса именно в вопросах прав человека. And I uh, remember very vividly how things were moving and improving along the lines of uh, uh, the Helsinki process and uh, towards a better human rights situation in what was then a uh, superpower, and uh, not just a superpower, but an evil power, an evil empire, uh, one that felt extremely strong. And yet, uh, it was uh, listening to uh, what was being said as part of the Helsinki process and improving its factor on human rights. I absolutely don't say that I don't see any other reason why it should be like that in the 21st century. Хотя бы, например, коли мы сейчас здесь, в Америке, в Конгрессе, в рамках процесса перезагрузки. And uh, I see uh, no reason whatsoever, and that being completely uh, sincere and uh, honest, why what happened, what was capable of happening back in the mid-70s, uh, could not repeat itself uh, in the context of the 21st century. Um, And now that we are in Congress, uh, in the U.S. Congress, uh, perhaps in the context of uh, this uh, still fairly uh, new initiative, that of resetting the Russia-U.S. relationship. Я полагаю, что это в наших общих интересах, и I believe that will serve our mutual interests. И нам это очень нужно и очень важно. And uh, we need it very badly, and it is very important to us. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you uh, uh, so very much. Uh, I've been informed that uh, a vote is going to be called in just a few minutes, and if you don't mind, I would like to place a, a, a couple of things on the record, uh, Mr. Kirk. Uh, first, um, to underscore uh, what you have said about 
the international uh, implications. When UCOS was taken over, there were investors um, from around the world, and a lot of them um, are from uh, America. A lot of them, once the company was renationalized and auctioned off, it's estimated that upwards of $7 billion was lost by international investors, including those in the United States. And that, in my judgment, underscores uh, your feelings regarding um, of what I believe true to, to be, that this is an international um, a matter of substantial consequence uh, that should continue to be addressed as it has been uh, in other governments. Uh, two uh, that come to mind, uh, the Swiss courts and the Dutch courts, um, have indicated um, uh, that they felt it was illegal. You know, buddy, um, either 15 or 16 years ago would have been my second visit to Russia. And like you, I felt um, the effects of Glasnost and the changes that were taking place. And like many Americans and other citizens around the world felt uh, that there would be uh, progress in that third basket um, uh, from the Helsinki Accord. Not by myself, but with three other uh, colleagues, one uh, 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 being a Democrat and two other Republicans. We had a meeting uh, with Lori, Yuri uh, Lushkov, who was then and until two days ago the mayor of Moscow. When I met you today, I told you that um, I was personal friends with um, uh, Gennady uh, Celesno. Ms. Aluna, who was in the Duma and I became good friends. And over the course of that time, I personally have witnessed um, having met regional officials and um, uh, countless others um, and recognize now the government has changed. And I think um, for the worse. Um, I want to say two further things. In reviewing the testimony of an earlier hearing held by Senator Wicker and attended uh, by the chairman that I'm co-chair of, of the uh, CSCE, Senator Cardin, um, uh, remarks uh, were made um, uh, by uh, uh, Senator uh, uh, Wicker uh, wherein he quoted your client. And footnote right there uh, for you and Freedom House and for uh, the brave and courageous lawyers uh, that are in uh, our pursuit of uh, fairness and justice. Uh, you are not unnoticed um, and you are supported uh, by uh, all of us uh, that believe uh, that all citizens of the world are entitled uh, to human rights. But Senator Wicker quoted Mr. Korakowski, which is almost poetry. He says, and I quote your client, you know, I really do love my country, my Moscow. It seems like one huge, apathetic, and indifferent anthill, but it's got so much soul, you know? Inside, I was sure about the people, and they turned out to be even better. 
than I thought. I read recently that in spite of that glass enclosure that he is in during this trial uh, with those of you that are there, or uh, that at least having served seven or more years uh, in a Siberian prison, that his spirit is not broken. Um, please convey to him uh, uh, that law um, is our uh, will to continue to point out uh, the injustice uh, that he and Mr. Lemedev and uh, your other clients are experiencing. But then, Senator Cardin closed with what I closed with here today, uh, just quoting him. He says, I think Senator Wicker and I both believe, and I now add myself uh, to the list, I was not at the hearing with them that day, believe in the Russian people. We believe in the future of Russia. But the future of Russia must be a nation that embraces its commitments under the Helsinki Final Act. It has to be a country that shows compassion for its citizens and shows justice. Russia can do that today by doing what is right for Mr. Korakovsky and his co-defendant release them from prison, respect the private rights and human rights of its citizens, and Russia then will be a nation that will truly live up to its commitment to its people to respect human rights and democratic principles. I don't know any way uh, to say it any more um, or concisely or in a manner to convey uh, why it is that the United States Commission on Security and Cooperation in Europe continues um, uh, to put a lamp on this particular um, trial, show trial, shameless trial, uh, and will uh, continue our efforts uh, uh, in that regard in the future, uh, both in Russia, elsewhere around the world, and here in the United States as well, lest you think that we don't criticize this group uh, from time to time when injustices occur. And please know uh, that uh, we uh, do and uh, will uh, continue. You have my best wishes, and I'm hopeful uh, that you will stay as strong as you have been and I deeply, deeply appreciate our Freedom House and I, my humble apologies, but got myself a bad knee and can't walk quite as fast. So when that bell goes off, it's going to take me time to get over there to the uh, House of Representatives. But uh, I thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Moscow, I was very much hoping that this would be possible and glad to see it come to fruition. Um, we're certainly uh, sort of honored in the sense to share a podium with Freedom House, who, you know, we, we go back to 1976, Freedom House goes back to 1941, uh, and are certainly quite pleased uh, at the announcement of the new executive director, David Kramer, who happens to have been a, a recent, former, and very active uh, member of our commission. So we, we're, we're happy to have those wires crossed, as it were, and would like to recognize you for understanding you as a was Thank you very much, Kyle. I uh, appreciate it. And uh, the, the co-organizing is the is is that uh, that we did this time was great because we co-organized, but you did all the work, so we like it. Um, let me thank you for being able to offer a, uh, a couple of comments on what is a very timely and important brief, briefing. I do so, as you said, as uh, on behalf of Freedom House, where I'm the director of programs in support of fundamental rights and freedoms worldwide. The subject of this session is of particularly intense interest to us because it focuses attention on the critical question of whether a citizen of the Russian Federation is able to access justice to the extent guaranteed in the Russian Constitution. The case today, the case that we're discussing today, is but one data point, albeit a high profile one. And the manner in which the defendant, Mr. Khodorkovsky, has been subjected to a barrage of new charges, deliberately timed to prolong his incarceration beyond the six years he has already served, has, with good reason, raised concerns in Russia and internationally about the sad state of the rule of law in present-day Russia. Last year, Russian President Dmitry Medvedev himself expressed concern about what he called legal nihilism in his country. He was right to raise it. Notwithstanding some modest gains in a few areas in reforming Russia's judicial system, the overall picture is quite grim. In Freedom House's annual survey of democratization in Central and Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, nations in transit, Russia continues to receive a low score for its legal framework and judicial independence for several reasons. The troubling lack of independence among judges, about which we've heard quite a bit, remains a serious shortcoming of the Russian legal system. Political interference by high-level high, high level government officials is commonplace. There are numerous, numerous reliable reports of judges being pressured or coerced into rendering a particular decision and in generally conforming to Kremlin preferences. At the same time, a culture of impunity prevails in Russia. One manifestation of this is that the masterminds behind the murders of prominent Kremlin critics have yet to be brought to justice. <coughs> The inability of courts to enforce judgments is another systemic failing. Nearly half of the European Court of Human Rights' judgments against Russia pertain directly to the failure to comply with court decisions. Pretrial detention, often on baseless legal grounds, is also a major weakness of Russia's judicial system, as was tragically highlighted by the death of Sergei Magnitsky last year. The use of torture or other forms of coercion to extract confessions from those in custody is widespread. Delays in legal proceedings, a matter with which Mr. Klukan is no doubt frustratingly familiar, is yet another obstacle to obtaining justice in contemporary Russia. And finally, the lack of public information about court cases seriously erodes citizens' confidence in the judicial process. Legislation limiting the types of cases that go to jury trials was also a move in the wrong direction. The fact that, according to ind independent Russian research organizations, a full one-third of Russians believe that the current raft of charges brought against Mr. Khodorkovsky are political in nature, while well, another 50% say they don't have enough information to form an opinion. These underscore the need for Russian authorities to be more, not less transparent, 
about the machinations of the legal system if anyone inside Russia or beyond its borders is to see it as a legitimate instrument of justice. Let me close by observing that it is too easy to criticize from afar. Mr. Pluvgod works within the Russian legal system in an effort to attain justice for his client. And we listen intently to his account of the challenges that that entails. Going forward, I think we share, we all share, in, an interest in supporting those dedicated and courageous men and women in Russia who are working to establish the rule of law and to make the judicial process more transparent, accessible, and fair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. Um, uh, you know, we have, uh, the, the way we plan this briefing, we have a little bit of time, certainly, for some interactions, some, some audience questions. That's one of the, the features I like the most about the briefing is we're able to get a little deeper into the topic. Uh, we are able to take public questions, which, by the way, will be transcribed and, and printed in our, our official hearing record. Um, uh, before we do that, I'd like to make a few comments and then open it up. And of course, as, as per usual, you can identify yourself and, and keep, keep it in the form of question and, and brief uh, so that we can entertain as many as possible. Um, you know, one of the things I was, I was quite happy to see come out in your testimony was, was the human cost, the human dimension of this trial. Uh, it is a legal, it's a legal process that, that, that's being carried out, but it has a real profound human cost, certainly on the families of uh, Mr. Hunterkowski and Nevitiv, um, and, and certainly others involved. And, and that for us is really a priority. You know, at, at, at here at the Helsinki Commission, we have three dimensions um, as we're set up in the Helsinki process. Uh, the, security dimension, the economic, the cultural, and the human dimension. But we are mandated by Congress uh, when we were set up to focus uh, on the human dimension. Um, and also that you mentioned that this is really not just a domestic affair. This is not something that just concerns Russia. Attention to it cannot be construed as, as interference in internal affairs. And as the Russians would say, the, 19, the 1991 uh, Moscow document uh, that was unanimously agreed to uh, by all the participating states of the OSCE enshrines that principle, that, that human rights are of sufficient importance and attention, that, that, that this type of interest in, you know, cannot be construed or dismissed as the old interference in, in internal affairs. Um, I also uh, would simply note that I believe today, uh, today or tomorrow at least, the uh, Review conference, OSC's review conference in, in Warsaw gets underway. Uh, this time of the year, uh, the OSC usually holds the annual Human Dimension Implementation Meeting, where everybody gets together in Warsaw, talks about how things are going the past year, uh, how the commitments are being implemented. Uh, it's a it's a naming and shaming uh, event, uh, very interesting, interesting and lively. Lots of NGOs, and it's also a forum where NGOs are able to speak on an equal basis with states. You know, we line up in the morning, and if, if the, you know, the U.S. may be behind Freedom House or, or uh, Tajikistan or whoever participates. Uh, this year, because we had a summit for the first time since the 1999 Istanbul summit planned for Kazakhstan, uh, it has taken the form of, of, a, of a review conference. Um, I believe these issues, rule of law, access to justice, will be, will be discussed on Monday, October 4th. I would certainly expect the Yukos case uh, and, and, and the situation uh, involving, and, and I mentioned coal because there's obviously the case against Yukos oil, the ongoing things, the GML case in the hay, and then there's also the personal prosecution of, you might even say persecution, of Karakowski and Platon Nevitev. Um, so with that, uh, Oh, and there was a couple, one other thing I wanted to mention, just along the lines of the, of the human cost. Um, one, of the, one of my favorite pieces on this whole case in, 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 in the many years that you know, it's been written about um, is an interview that Harkovsky did uh, through an exchange of letters with Boris uh, Kunin of Russian Esquire. I, I, I continue to go back to this piece and just mine it for the very moving, again, the illustration of the human cost of it, 
and also in a sense the, the remarkable, the transformation as it were of Mikhail Levitsevich from Russia's richest oligarch, um, someone who as is, is commonly said may have been no saint, um, to what appears to me as possibly the freest man in Russia. Having had it all, having lost it all, uh, and remaining unbroken, and being able to say those words that Chairman Hastings quoted, words that are really quite optimistic and, and, and almost seem to incongruent with the situation. Uh, I, I remember when he was transferred to Matroskaya Tishina for the beginning of his trial, there was a picture and, and being carried on the news wires as he got out of a prison van, cramped prison van, he gets out and he gives a smile to the cameras. It's not a cynical smile. It's not an in-your-face smile. It's, it's a warm smile to his countrymen. And, and uh, just a couple quotes and then, and then we can open up to question and answer. Mikhail Borisovich says here, you know, I could have left, but after Platon's arrest, I regarded this as a betrayal. At the end of the summer, I took a trip and said my goodbyes to my colleagues who were already beyond the border and returned to Russia. He's asked, Akunin asked, were there minutes when you regretted that you hadn't left? Very human answer. I don't know. You know, there's probably two honest answers. Yes, I regret it every day. No, I don't regret it. Because had I left, I would not be able to live. He's asked about his parents. Parents, he laughs. And we have had the, had the great privilege of meeting his mother when, when she was in town. For them, honor was always dearer than life. Their own life definitely, and maybe even mine. So here I had no doubts. He talks about his children. I very much hope that my children too, knowing well since preschool that Papa's in jail, will grow up understanding why I could not have done otherwise. My wife promises that she'll be able to explain this to me. Another, another comment that struck me here. Scoundrels are often more successful than decent people, but are they happy? That's the question. If they were happier, then we'd be living among nothing but scoundrels. In the world, in the world would triumph strength and meanness, but it's not at all like that after all. Strength loses out to courage, meanness to honesty, hatred to love, not at first, but always in the end. And the world becomes a better place. And he talks about what is going on. What is taking place is the advancement upwards of the most sullied ones projecting downwards and into society their distorted moral principles. But what can you say about them? Pitiful, miserable people who in their old age will be scared of death. These to me are, are, are just profoundly moving words from someone who is on one level a vulgar businessman in the business of making money. What could be more crass, particularly in, 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 in the crazy 90s in Russia? And yet they sound similar to a Russian literary figure, to someone who circumstances, history, fate has chosen him for a different role. Uh, he's in good company, frankly, having sacked, as the Russians say, in Siberia. Um, and it's, uh, again, I, I'm very struck by it, and I think it's possibly one of the most interesting aspects of this case. And it's, to me, it's far more interesting than rebutting ridiculous, absurd legal charges, particularly in the second case. I know, obviously, Vadim, you have to litigate those absurdities, so you must get involved in maybe that drudgery. Um, but uh, I, I, I'll just finish on, on this on this vein uh, to quote the famous words of a beloved Russian Silver Age poet, Anna Khmantova, in her Requiem that was written around the crucible and the tragedy and, and, and the nightmare of the Stalinists there. Her son, Lev Gumilyov, was in prison. Um, and to me, there's, there's so much sort of appropriate in this comment that begins reckoning, not under foreign skies, nor under foreign wings protected. I shared all this with my own people there where misfortune had abandoned us. It's obviously far more beautiful than Russian, um, but I, I, think of a, I think of a Mikhail Borisovich who doesn't leave Russia and wage a proxy war from a foreign country who, 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 who returns.
turns and faces this fate with his people through some very turbulent and difficult years. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I don't want to take any more time that we have for question and answer. I'd like to open it up to anything, com comments, questions. Uh, Josh, you said there's a mic. If you could come up to the mic, that'll make it easier for the transcribers. Who wants to start? If, if no one has a question, I will start with a question. Um, I wonder what your take is on this. Is there any sense that, and again, I know this would be speculation, uh, because I imagine you're probably not in close contact with the likes of Igor Sech and, and, and others. In, in the group. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, is there any sense, or, or even speculation now, that on the part of the architects of this fiasco, that maybe it was a mistake, that, that the damage to Russia's reputation has been too big, uh, the financial cost, um, sort of the, the, you know, the opportunity cost. But that this whole process has to, go, has to move forward to save face now. And you know, also because of the unique qualities of the prisoner, here you have someone who is unbroken, is, is not admitting guilt, makes it difficult even to pardon him. Or is this not the case? And will there be more? Could, could Lushkov be next? Could Medvedev be next? Yeah, I want to say something. Для нас, несомненно, что в российской власти и вокруг нее есть довольно большое количество влиятельных людей, которые прекрасно понимают, что это трагическая ошибка с далеко идущими негативными последствиями, которая должна быть исправлена. К сожалению, это не те люди, которые принимают решение. I can say the following. Uh, we have no doubt whatsoever that uh, there is quite a number of individuals uh, among the Russian authorities uh, in the Russian government who understand that uh, this was a tragic, huge mistake and uh, one that needs to be amended and uh, rectified. Unfortunately, these are not the same individuals uh, who make the final decision. These individuals cannot make uh, a decision themselves, but they are in a position to help the president make um, the decision should the president wish to receive such help. So, касается непосредственных организаторов этой расправы, то есть некоторые, да, вы абсолютно правы, мы не общаемся. Но есть некоторые косвенные признаки того, что в их лагере не все так едино и благополучно, как это было еще, может быть, два-три года. И уж пару или семь лет. As far as the actual architects uh, of this situation, uh, you're exactly right, we are not in touch uh, with them, but there is uh, indirect evidence that even among them, uh, there's not as much cohesion <coughs> as uh, it was two or three years ago, let alone seven years ago. Who will be the next? I don't want to guess, I don't want to bring it up, but it's obvious that in a situation when a person can't find a protection in their country with the help of the law, the next can be absolutely anyone. As far as the pipeline of such uh, situations are concerned, I, I have no intention to uh, try and forecast who might be next. Uh, what I can say is that in a situation where uh, an individual cannot find justice uh, in his or her own country uh, through the uh, judicial system, it's such that anybody and everybody can be next. We should have much to не свободны таком обществе, в таком государстве, потому что ими движет страх. It also means that people are not free and not feel free uh, when they live uh, in a 
society like that and uh, with a government like that because they're driven by fear. Они свободные люди не могут делать настоящую модернизацию. And people who are not free cannot engage in uh, genuine organization. Thank you. Um, anyone, the mic is open. We have probably 20 minutes. Substance of the 
those meetings uh, that we had with our clients, even though, of course, uh, they were not there, not even as a fly on the wall. They were the key level of technology. Uh, it could be that now technology is involved. Ну, а что касается Сахарова времен президента Медведева, as far as Medvedev's Sakharov, or Sakharov of the Medvedev era, в Матросской тишине, это тюрьма, в которой находится Михаил Ходорковский, в его камере нет телефона. At the Матросская тишина, prison where Ходорковский is being held, there is no telephone in his cell. И мобильного телефона Ходорковского тоже нет. Either a landline or a cell phone. Но если президент Медведев захочет позвонить Кадаковскому или как это сделал Горбачев в свое время, то что Медведев, что Медведев wish to make a phone call to Кадаковский, as Mikhail Gorbachev once famously made a phone call to Kadyrov and Sakharov. Я думаю, что новые технологии позволят ему это сделать. I believe the now technology question uh, will come in very handy and uh, make such a phone call uh, feasible. And if uh, <coughs> they can't get through to Khodorkovsky on the phone, I will be happy uh, to answer the call and uh, act as a go-between and uh, make sure that they connect. There's just one small problem. And that is that uh, this phone call should actually be made. Я думаю, что президенту Медведеву это нужно помощь какая-то. And uh, I think that President, uh, for that to happen, President Medvedev uh, needs help and uh, assistance. Well, we know Russia is a leader in nanotechnology, so um, anyone else? Uh, Ron, please. Uh, to Mr. Khodorkovsky's case and can be looked at from many different levels. And certainly it's important for us never to forget the truly human dimension that has been, has, has been touched upon here. In a certain sense, it might be easily dismissed as sort of a political vendetta, if you will, by certain powers that be that, for whatever reason, may have perceived Mr. Khodorkovsky's support of certain elements of, of Russian society as potentially a threat. I don't know. There was a mention made regarding the losses of investors in UCOS. And I, I guess I want to raise the, the maybe indelicate question. Because one thing I've learned of working on Capitol Hill for 30 years is that when you're dealing with people uh, in society, when there is money involved, people pay attention very quickly. And obviously, we're talking about huge sums in the, in the case of your client's business or former business. So who has really benefited in a financial sense from uh, the legal uh, pursuit and, and hounding of your client? Um, and while we see President Medvedev and Prime Minister Putin um, going through sort of the normal functions of their offices. It seems to me, it strikes me as though they're involved in a lot of other transactions and things of that nature, and perhaps their modest financial disclosure statements don't quite reveal the true magnitude of, um, of the wealth and resources that they've been able to accumulate while serving in the public sphere in the Russian Federation. I realize it's somewhat indelicate, but why not? A group in Bakros.
while it's being translated, we'll probably have time for another question. So if anyone wants to think one up um, before we adjourn. Actually, this is not such a hard question to answer uh, because uh, there are facts that uh, <coughs> uh, suggest an answer, and uh, uh, those facts are uh, well known. Uh, the bulk of what was taken away from uh, UCOS and, uh, of course, from its uh, individual uh, share shareholders, uh, including the core shareholders such as Levy, Tarkovsky, and uh, others, uh, all ended up in one place. But the news, uh, Uh, and that place is known as uh, the Rosnet. Председателем Совета директоров компании Rosnet, chairman of the board, господин Игорь Сечин. The chairman of the board is uh, Mr. Igor Sechin, который в то время, когда расправа начиналась, был заместителем руководителя администрации президента, prosecution direction. Uh, was just uh, beginning, was uh, deputy chief of staff of the Russian president. And, uh, these days, uh, he is uh, deputy chairman of the Russian government. Rosneft, so Rosneft, an uh, oil company which which um, has since emerged as uh, Russia's largest and uh, most appealing uh, investment-wise uh, company, uh, primarily uh, because of the Yugos assets that uh, it inherited. Yes, the very official statement of the Russian government officials Uh, this company uh, is now being uh, scheduled for privatization. What extent uh, it will be privatized has not been announced. However, the fact that it will be privatized uh, is beyond doubt at this point. I'm not going uh, to set out the uh, dominoes uh, any further in this uh, logical chain of events. Uh, for the incorrect declaration of the source of the profits, I just read in the news that the Russian President of the Federation fired a general for this same for the submission of the incorrect declaration of profits. And as far as uh, Mr. Gordon personally comes. Uh, I've uh, just read today, matter of fact, uh, in the news that uh, the Russian president uh, has uh, sacked a uh, Russian uh, general uh, exactly for, uh, for that, for uh, lying on his uh, uh, tax So I guess uh, if uh, that, is, uh, that general happened to be the person uh, that this kind of uh, Uh, second practices have started with, apparently he must have been the most dishonest. But that of course, uh, that, of course is just uh, uh, a suggestion uh, of mine, something that I'm uh, thinking is uh, possible because I don't really have facts to the If you're serious, I think that we need to know about a lot of things that are not transparent now. Um, if, uh, if I were to be more serious, uh, I would uh, simply say that uh, we uh, have yet to find out uh, a lot of uh, information and facts uh, about uh, this especially non-transparent aspect of the U.S. case that you have just uh, asked a question about. Thank you. Do we have any? Any last, uh, any burning desires, or 
before we close the, the record on this uh, interesting briefing today. Uh, with that, uh, I certainly would like to thank everybody for coming. Um, and by the evening, it's certainly been a real pleasure uh, to have you here. Uh, and also, just for those who may not have grabbed the, uh, Mr. Klukman's most interesting bio, having been a, a mayor of a, a rather significant city in Russia, as well, uh, particularly appropriate here in Congress, uh, a member of the Supreme Soviet of 1990 to 93 which I think the case can be made was perhaps the most freely and fairly elected democratic or parliament in Russia's history. Yes. Um, and not just Russia's modern history, but going back to the Duma of Nick, uh, Nicholas and, and also possibly back to the Nogura Invention. <laughs> so it, it, it's, uh, we, we, we receive you with great, with great pleasure. Um, you know, this is, a, this is obviously a very important case. It's a historic case for uh, you know, the development of the modern Russian state. Uh, I am uh, not so optimistic about Washington's leverage or ability to affect the outcome of the case. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe, maybe somehow, as you said, it can end just. Uh, but certainly, uh, for our part, we will tell the story for the record, uh, and I can assure you that this commission will not forget your client uh, and, and the importance of this whole rather sad affair. Uh, we'll have the statement and transcript up on our website as soon as we can, uh, within the next couple of days. Uh, I know a number of our commissioners very much hope to be here today, but with the session on both sides of the hill winding down, I just want possible, I believe we may have a statement out from some of them following the briefing uh, in the form of a press release, and uh, I, I think that's that. Uh, thank you all for coming. We do have, uh, we will have this fall, uh, possibly even while we're out of session, a series of hopefully uh, pretty provocative uh, briefings on subjects related to Russia. So if you are interested, please uh, sign up on our website. I'm sure Freedom House has a full schedule as well. I know, I know David Greger wants to hit the ground running. So um, over that, the hearing, uh, the briefing is adjourned. Thank you.